Welcome back. In the last lecture, I described how high doses of stimulant drugs can result in convulsions. But in many animals, especially highly inbred strains, there's a tendency for seizures to occur spontaneously. What can you do when waves of ex excitatory discharges disrupt attention and even consciousness? Today, we're going to talk about anticonvulsant compounds that are used to reestablish that balance by blocking abnormal foci in the brain where seizures originate. Seizures are defined as transient alterations in behavior originating from an abnormal spread of neuronal excitability at sites with an imbalance between neuronal excitation and inhibition. Seizures can be either simple where the animal remains conscious, or complex, where there's a complete loss of consciousness. Partial seizures involve a specific region of the cortex, whereas generalized seizures are in both hemispheres. Most seizures that result from an epileptic condition are self-limiting. This may be because the tissue can't support a high level of activity because of either insufficient oxygen, hypoxia, or too much accumulation of CO2 with an associated change in the pH of the microenvironment. Or there may be insufficient glucose. One reason that it's important to treat epileptic conditions is that each time a seizure occurs, there's a phenomenon called kindling that happens. After the seizure, the tissue around the areas of the epileptic foci changes and actually becomes more likely to be recruited by future seizures. This makes the tissue involved not only more excitable, but also larger. Anticonvulsants prevent this from happening, not by repairing the tissue, but by preventing the seizures and stopping the progression of kindling itself. There are many different causes of seizures. If the condition is associated with something that can be treated, obviously it's better to control seizures with anticonvulsants for only a short period of time until the primary disorder is under control. To do this, you have to pinpoint the etiology. Seizures can result from any condition that induces neuronal damage. These include things like developmental disorders, like hydrocephalus, uh, metabolic disorders like hypocalcemia or liver disease, neoplastic conditions like brain tumors, nutritional deficiencies, most notable among these would be thiamine deficiency. CNS infections, they could be either bacterial or fungal and so forth. Toxicity like uh, strychnine poisoning or organophosphates or trauma, like a car accident. But the vast majority of seizures in dogs can't be attributed to any of these conditions and are basically genetic. That is, there's an inherited tendency for the activity in the brain to become imbalanced. This is referred to as primary epilepsy or idiopathic epilepsy because the cause is still unknown. Lots of breeds are prone to epileptic conditions, including miniature schnauzers, collies, basset hounds, cocker spaniels, and any of the many highly inbred dogs today like German shepherds, poodles, etc. One type of seizure is status epilepticus. It's not necessarily associated with any particular etiology, but it's a general description of a continuous seizure that needs to be addressed because of the respiratory arrest and oxygen deprivation that make it life-threatening. As I've mentioned in past lectures, you treat this condition with diazepam or related compounds like propofol given intravenously. Benzodiazepines can be used because they're highly lipid soluble, making them one of the fastest anticonvulsant drugs to pass through the blood-brain barrier. 
You can think of it uh, as butter mixing into butter. Another approach, if you don't happen to have a benzodiazepine or propofol handy, or the animal's not appropriate for their use, is to use a short or ultra-short-acting barbiturate like pentobarbital. In this case, you need to be sure to use an anesthetic dose. It's important to use an adequate dose because many barbiturates are anticonvulsant only when they produce an anesthetic effect that inhibits all brain activity. The type of seizure that you'll be seeing most often is generally a grand mal seizure. The seizure itself is referred to as an ictal phase or ictus. It usually involves strong tonic contractions of skeletal muscles. It may be jerking, uncoordinated, large motor activity, and a loss of consciousness. There's usually biting of the tongue and frothing at the mouth. It can cause loss of bladder or bowel control, reflecting auto an autonomic component. But the seizure itself, or the ictus, is just one part of the whole episode. Before the motor activity, there's usually a period of time called the pre-ictal phase, when the animal is aware that something is going to happen. The animal might be restless, nervous, whining, trembling, salivating excessively, needing more attention than usual, wandering aimlessly, or even hiding. We don't know exactly what happens in dogs, but in humans, they describe a lot of sensory abnormalities of taste or odor, dizziness, nausea, fear, pain in the gut, head, or thorax. Based on their behavior, we have to assume that animals have the same sensory distortions during the pre-ictal phase. After the seizure, or during the post-ictal phase, the animal usually appears confused or disoriented. There's a strong tendency for them to just hole up and go into a deep sleep until they recover. So what can you do to control these abnormal behavioral responses? Basically, the, pro the approach has been much the same as developing depressant compounds. In fact, there's an overlap between anticonvulsants and depressants. Many anticonvulsants have sedation as a side effect, and some sedatives also have anticonvulsant activity. But there's no perfect correspondence between these two characteristics. In fact, ideally, the best anticonvulsant would be not sedative at all. If you work for a pharmaceutical company, you would probably try to either decrease excitatory neurotransmission by blocking sodium channels or by inhibiting excitatory neurotransmitter receptors. Another approach is to increase inhibitory transmission, specifically by increasing neurotransmitters like GABA, uh, GABA release, GABA receptor sensitivity, or decreasing GABA degradation. There's a general approach to treatment of seizures using anticonvulsants. Begin with a single small dose of an anticonvulsant drug. Usually only one drug is tested initially, but it may be a combination of two, such as phenobarbital plus potassium bromide as an adjunct. Then increase the dose until you're able to control the seizures or until the toxic effects are intolerable. The interval for these increases in dose might differ from one drug to another based on their half-life, which determines the time it takes to reach a new equilibrium, but usually it's at weekly intervals or longer. Finally, it's usually necessary to monitor the patient for a few lab values. First, blood value of the anticonvulsant drug itself might be needed to ensure that it's adequate but not too high. Secondly, you might need to know whether there's an accumulation of endogenous compounds that reflect potentially fatal liver damage. Treatment of epilepsy is not really like the treatment of most other conditions. It's chronic, ever-changing, and requires more money and more time and effort from the client than most other conditions. So you need to communicate these things to the owner so they can make an informed decision on the long-term care of their animal. First and foremost, 
inform them of the potential cost of the treatment. Be sure to describe the monitoring involved. They'll need to log the frequency of seizures and report this each time they meet with you while you're developing your treatment plan. This allows you to establish the optimal dose and drug. Explain that while Drugs constitute a long-term approach to the control of seizure activity. They won't cure the epilepsy. They simply control the number and intensity of seizures and will have to be monitored for the animal's lifetime. A variety of drugs can be tested, but there are some seizure disorders that are simply not completely controlled by any drug that's currently available. During treatment, multiple lab tests might be needed depending on the drugs used to monitor the concentration of the drug in, uh, in the circulation and to monitor liver function because many of these compounds are hepatotoxic. Finally, stress the fact that compliance with the treatment schedule is essential. If the drugs are stopped abruptly, seizures may reoccur. And this may even be lethal because abrupt cessation is characterized by withdrawal seizures. This slide summarizes the most commonly used anticonvulsants in dogs. The first line drugs include phenobarbital and either sodium or potassium bromide. In the event that phenobarbital and bromides don't provide adequate control or aren't tolerated well by the dog, Drugs like levetiracetam or zonisamide are often used. These drugs are very promising, but both are more expensive. In addition, levetiracetam needs to be delivered more frequently, making it less desirable in this regard. Each incremental increase in the dosing schedule, for example, going from twice a day to three times a day, makes it logarithmically more difficult to get compliance by the owner. One disadvantage of using newer compounds is that the full spectrum of their side effects is never as clear in the initial years of their use than later on. One reason we know so much about phenobarbital is simply that it's been used in so many animals and humans for many, many years. This slide summarizes the commonly used anticonvulsants in the cat. You'll notice that some drugs are similar to those in dogs. Phenobarbital is still the most widely used anticonvulsant in cats, along with levetiracetam and occasionally zonisamide. However, bromides are not used, whereas diazepam is occasionally used. Diazepam and its relatives are excellent anticonvulsants in both dogs and cats for things like toxicities and status epilepticus. However, diazepam is not useful prophylactically for long-term therapy in the dog. In the cat, diazepam is metabolized very slowly, so it can be administered less frequently than in the dog, but it still has problems with toxicity, making it a second or third line drug. These are drugs that are only very infrequently used in small animals. They may provide an additional degree of anticonvulsant activity when combined with phenobarbital or bromide. But they're not used in part because of their short half-lives. You should recognize their names because they still appear in some clinics, but we won't go into detail about them. There are three additional anticonvulsants, unique because they're not used much in cases of epilepsy. Instead, they're analgesic in conditions of neuropathic pain. It's very difficult to control neuropathic pain compared to, for example, inflammatory pain. Even using drugs like morphine and other narcotic analgesics. The sensitivity of neuropathic pain to anticonvulsant drugs has been interpreted as evidence that neuropathic pain may, in fact, be a type of seizure disorder. When treating epilepsy, it's common to give several drugs to provide optimal control. Why is this done? The drugs used to control seizures vary in their mechanism of action, as shown here on this chart. When drugs have different mechanisms to elicit the same effect, 
Sometimes they produce a synergistic interaction when combined. Otherwise, drugs with an identical mechanism of action would be merely additive, resulting in a log-related dose-response curve. It would be just like giving more of the same drug. So the goal is to combine drugs with distinct mechanisms of action to optimize their anticonvulsant activity and to decrease the dose of each drug needed so the side effects are minimized. So the first thing we need to know about these drugs is their mechanism of action. First, we'll quickly review the action of diazepam that we've already discussed in the section on sedatives. As you probably remember, diazepam enhances the flux of chloride ions through the GABA, that is GABA aminobutyric acid, activated chloride channel by allosterically binding to a site on the GABA channel complex that's distinct from the site to which GABA binds. This increases the opening frequency when GABA is released and activ activates the channel. You'll notice that phenobarbital also increases chloride conductance through the GABA-A channel, just as benzodiazepines do. However, phenobarbital binds to a different allosteric site on the GABA receptor complex than benzodiazepines. This results in a slightly different modulation of the channel. As a result, barbiturates like phenobarbital prolong the time that the channel remains open, allowing huge amounts of chloride to flow through. Benzodiazepines, on the other hand, merely increase the frequency of channel opening, allowing less hyperpolarization of the neuron than barbiturates. So benzodiazepines tend to have a sealing depressant effect. That is, they only produce sedation. Whereas some barbiturates are used as hypnotics or even as anesthetics. Next on our list is potassium or sodium bromide. It also produces an effect by an interaction with all chloride channels, not just the GABA-linked ones shown here. Instead of binding to any site on the channel itself, the bromide ion flows through the channel faster than chloride itself. This produces a greater degree of hyperpolarization than you'd be able to produce with chloride alone. The bromide ion alone is actually larger in terms of its molecular weight than the chloride ion, so you might initially think that it would be the reverse, that chloride passes through faster than bromide. However, in solution, both are hydrated, that is, surrounded by water molecules, because bromide and chloride are both very hygroscopic, that is, they attach to water easily. The hydrated form of bromide is smaller in terms of size than the hydrated form of chloride. So this small diameter is believed to account for the more rapid transit of bromide through the chloride channel than that of chloride itself. Levoteracetam and zonisamide have mechanisms that are also distinct from phenobarbital. Instead of influencing GABA channel activity, Levoteracetam binds to synaptic vesicles through the SV2A glycoprotein and modulates transmitter release. As you can see on this diagram, levoteracetam also inhibits presynaptic calcium channels. Since calcium flux in this location, that is the axon hillock, is necessary for transmitter release, this also reduces the transmitter in the synaptic cleft in response to each impulse hitting the terminal. Both of these actions would tend to block synaptic function. On the bottom, you see that zonisamide not only inhibits calcium channels, an effect it has in common with levoteracetam, it also inhibits voltage-gated sodium channels. In effect, this not only blocks the release of neurotransmitter by blocking calcium, but also has a local anesthetic action by blocking sodium. Together, this decreases the propagation of action potentials in the brain. 
you can see how the difference in their mechanisms makes them useful as adjuncts when they're used with phenobarbital, whose action is focused on GABA activity. As adjuncts, they may produce even greater adenconvulsant activity than when used alone. At this point, you should be able to name the drugs that are most commonly used for the treatment of epilepsy in the dog and the cat. You should also know the general mechanism of action of those drugs as summarized here. In the next section, we'll discuss these drugs in more detail to consider some of their clinically important characteristics. We'll also review the three anticonvulsants that are often used for their analgesic activity. Now that you know more about epileptic conditions and the types of drugs that are available to treat them, what determines whether you would choose one drug over another? And what might you use if the more common drugs don't provide enough control? The next part of this series examines some of the unique characteristics of anticonvulsant compounds that make them more or sometimes less suitable in different situations. In addition, we'll discuss three anticonvulsant drugs that you might try in situations of allodynic, that is, neuropathic pain, a condition that's very hard to control using more traditional analgesic compounds like NSAIDs or opiates. The most widely used anticonvulsant compound to prevent seizures in an epileptic animal is phenobarbital, or luminol, its trade name. It's a barbituric acid derivative. But you should know that all barbiturate type anesthetics that share this common ring structure are anticonvulsant when given at an anesthetic dose. This assumes, of course, that the drug can produce anesthesia without a life-threatening respiratory depression. Phenobarbital, shown here, is unique amongst barbiturates in that it's also anticonvulsant in about 50% of dogs at doses that are merely sedative or less. It has a low toxicity, it's inexpensive, and only DEA Schedule IV drug. Altogether, this makes phenobarbital a popular first choice to try in both animals and humans alike. Phenobarbital increases chloride ion conductance through the GABA-A channels. This prolongs the time that the channel spends in the open position. However, phenobarbital also decreases cerebral metabolism and blocks voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, how these additional actions play into the anticonvulsant action of this drug is unclear. So for now, the important point to remember is its interaction with the GABA receptor complex. Phenobarbital is absorbed slowly when given orally, so the peak effect is four to eight hours later, and even later than that when given with food. It takes about two weeks or five half-lives to reach a steady state in the blood and brain, so any conclusions about its efficacy in a particular patient need to wait until its full effect has been reached. It can be given intravenously, but the absorption of the drug into the brain, even after an IV injection, isn't fast enough to stop ongoing seizures. So in an emergency, use a more lipid-soluble drug like propofol, diazepam, or pentobarbital. The distribution of phenobarbital reflects the fact that it's a weak acid, as are all barbiturates. For this reason, barbiturates are dissolved in a relatively basic solution. The designation sodium phenobarbital reflects the fact that these drugs are salts because a small amount of sodium hydroxide was used to make the solution sufficiently basic to drive the phenobarbital into the more soluble ionized state. In lipids, Phenobarbital is less soluble than other barbiturates, so it's only about one-third protein bound in the circulation. 
This moderate lipid solubility accounts for the slow absorption and distribution across the blood-brain barrier. Phenobarbital is metabolized by the P450 enzymes in the liver. In addition to being metabolized there, phenobarbital is one of the most potent inducers of the P450 drug metabolizing enzymes in the liver. In fact, if given in large doses daily for just one week, rats injected with phenobarbital will have significantly heavier livers than those injected with saline. The tendency for phenobarbital to induce drug metabolizing enzymes in this fashion that affect its own rate of metabolism as well as that of other drugs is one reason that you need to continuously reevaluate the dose that's needed to control seizures. The drug is simply inactivated more rapidly the longer the animal is treated. Although much of phenobarbital is metabolized, it's sufficiently polar that about one-fourth is excreted in the urine in the form of the parent compound. This means that in the event of an overdose, you can alkalinize the urine to maximize the ionization of the drug in the urine. Alkalinization can be done using something like sodium bicarbonate solutions given IV. This helps eliminate the phenobarbital from the body rather than allowing it to be reabsorbed by the kidney as the unionized form is. The advantages of using phenobarbital include its 50% success rate, its long half-life so you don't have to administer the drug so frequently, the fact that it decreases the activity of epileptic foci with minimal sedation, and the fact that tolerance develops to the sedative effects of the drug, but not usually as fast to the anticonvulsant effects. The disadvantages of using phenobarbital include a group of negative side effects, many of which you also see with other anticonvulsant compounds. They include things like drowsiness and sedation, ataxia, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia, and nystagmus. Although tolerance usually develops to most of these effects, it can be very disconcerting to owners to see their dogs sleep all the time, only to wake up and eat, drink, and pee the rest of the time. Most serious conditions include such things as hepatotoxicity and uh, physical dependence on the drug after its prolonged use. Dependence means that an abrupt withdrawal actually precipitates seizures more easily than before the drug was used. In animals that already have a seizure condition, these convulsions can actually be life-threatening. There are lots of drug interactions using phenobarbital. You don't have to memorize these specific drugs. They are included just as examples. But generally, there are four ways that drug interactions occur. First, phenobarbital induces liver enzymes which increases the degradation of all other drugs metabolized by those same pathways. Second, phenobarbital competes with other drugs for binding to plasma proteins. In this way, phenobarbital increases the effect of other drugs by making more available in the free, unbound state. Third, Phenobarbital increases the actual synthesis of proteins that bind to drugs in the plasma. So over time, there's a decreased effect of those drugs because they tend to be bound to this larger reservoir of protein. Fourth, when phenobarbital is combined with any other CNS depressant compound, there's an increased depressant effect. The next group of drugs are benzodiazepines that can be used in cats, but they're not the first drug of choice for chronic administration, even in this species. This group includes not only the prototype diazepam, or the trade name Valium, which is the oldest and still widely used, but also midazolam, lorazepam, and clonazepam. In order for benzodiazepines to get into the brain as fast as possible, 
they're usually given intravenously in situations like status epilepticus. But a rectal application can be used if the cat is too fractious to reach a vein or when administered at home with the client. When used as a general anticonvulsant in epileptic cats, it's usually given orally. We've already covered the fact that these drugs increase conductance through GABA-A-linked chloride channels, increasing the frequency of the channel opening. This results in a hyperpolarized cell. Because they're very lipid soluble, benzodiazepines are absorbed orally and cross the blood-brain barrier rapidly. The lipid solubility also makes them have a high binding to plasma. They're metabolized in the liver where they may even saturate the enzymes. The big difference in the use of benzodiazepines in cats and dogs is that the T1 half in cats is fairly long, about 22 hours, whereas the T1 half in dogs is very short, only six hours. So you'd end up having to administer the drug about four times a day in the dog. The longer half-life in cats allows it to be administered less frequently and still retain its anti-epileptic activity. So benzodiazepines are useful for long-term therapy in cats because they're less, there's less tolerance to their effects and they have a longer half-life but they're still not usually a first choice for primary epilepsy in cats because of the risk of acute hepatic necrosis. In dogs, diazepam can be used for status epilepticus, but it's not used prophylactically, that is to prevent seizures in epileptic dogs. This is because of their rapid metabolism and because of the greater tolerance that develops to their anticonvulsant action. Tolerance to diazepam seems to develop even faster, about one week, than to clonazepam, which lasts about two to five weeks. Termination of treatment with benzodiazepines should be done slowly because abrupt withdrawal of the drug can result in seizures, listlessness, wet dog shakes, weight loss, hyperthermia, and dorsal recumbency. But remember that many of these signs are the same for withdrawal from most other anticonvulsant compounds. So missing a dose of any of these drugs should always be avoided. But the more rapid the decrease in blood concentrations, the more intense the withdrawal. So for example, dogs are more susceptible to withdrawal seizures from diazepam than cats whose blood concentrations decrease more slowly. Potassium bromide is a very simple and old drug. In fact, it's probably the oldest anticonvulsant ever used in human and animal medicine. It's the bromide ion that's important, so the drug can be either in the form of potassium bromide or sodium bromide. It's used either alone or with phenobarbital in dogs, especially when animals are refractory to the effect of phenobarbital alone. However, it's not used in cats because it has a tendency to cause asthma. Remember that sodium bromide is anticonvulsant because bromide ions pass through the chloride channel even faster than chloride itself, causing hyperpolarization of the neuron. This is because a large negative charge accumulates inside the cell. Bromide is absorbed completely when given orally, and because it's not bound to any plasma proteins, it has few, if any, interactions with any other drugs in the circulation, making it a perfect adjunct. It's distributed throughout the whole body through chloride channels. It's not metabolized and does not induce liver enzymes, as many other anticonvulsants do. The half-life, or T1 half, is about 25 days in dogs, very long. This is because it's reabsorbed in the kidney, like chloride. 
Even though it has a long half-life in the body, it should be administered daily in small doses to avoid a bolus of either the sodium or potassium that's administered with it. The disadvantages of using bromides include sedation, incoordination, and irritability. Along the GI tract, it causes anorexia, constipation, vomiting, and polyphagia at an anticonvulsant dose. The most serious effect is asthma in cats, the reason for the contraindication in that species. But in any species, it can cause dermatitis and conjunctivitis. In the event of an overdose or unmanageable adverse reaction, administration of sodium chloride, salt, to antagonize the effects of bromides is recommended. The chloride competes with and enhances the excretion of the bromide. Levoteracetam, or Keppra, its trade name, can be used in either dog or cat, usually given three times a day. It binds to the synaptic vesicles and modulates the release of neurotransmitter from nerve endings, presumably by interfering with calcium flux. Levoteracetam is entirely excreted by the kidneys and not metabolized. This means that it can be used even in cases of liver damage, but it's contraindicated in cases of kidney damage as well as in cases of pregnancy. The side effects are similar to those of phenobarbital, basically drowsiness and ataxia with some behavioral changes. The GI tract may be upset with vomiting and diarrhea and a decrease in appetite in cats especially. There may be some tolerance to the anticonvulsant effect and the drug should be terminated gradually to avoid withdrawal seizures. Zonisamide or Zonagran inhibits voltage-gated calcium channels and sodium channels blocking the conduction of axons and inhibiting the release of neurotransmitter at the terminals. The side effects include sedation and ataxia, vomiting, and loss of appetite. It's teratogenic, so it shouldn't be given to pregnant animals. And when used with phenobarbital as an adjunct, zonisamide is cleared faster than when used alone, so higher doses should be used when it's given in this combination. This set of drugs are not widely used, but you may want to have them in your recognition memory because they can still be found in some clinics. They're not used at all in cats and less commonly in dogs and other than other drugs. This is partly because of their individual toxicities, but in large part because they are also very short acting. These four anticonvulsant compounds not only have half-lives that are too short to be useful, in addition to that, felbamate can cause aplastic anemia, primadon is hepatotoxic, the dose of phenytoin is difficult to regulate and the drug itself is also hepatotoxic, and finally valproic acid is simply too short acting to be useful. So these drugs are rarely used for long-term use in epileptic animals. The three drugs that have both anticonvulsant and analgesic activity include carbamazepine, or Tegretol, gabapentin, Neurontin, and pregabalin, Lyrica. They're used for a specific type of pain called neuropathic or allogenic pain. This type of pain is characterized by stabbing, throbbing, burning, shooting, sharp pain, rather than dull aches. It includes conditions like diabetic neuropathies, post-herpetic uh, um, neuralgias, and some cancer pain. It's very difficult to control neuropathic pain using over-the-counter non-narcotic analgesics or even opioids, the narcotic analgesics. Carbamazepine, or Tegretol, is notable in that it produces no CNS depression. It's anticonvulsant and analgesic in both dogs and cats, but it's not used widely in either. 
it binds to adenosine A1 receptors as an agonist. Just for the sake of comparison and contrast, remember that stimulants of the methylxanthine category are adenosine antagonists. Carbamazepine causes drowsiness, ataxia, nausea, and vomiting, as do many other anticonvulsants. But more importantly, it can cause aplastic anemia and agranulocytosis. In addition, dermatitis, blood disorders, water retention, fetal abnormalities, and induction of liver enzymes. Toxicity includes convulsions, respiratory depression, and coma. Gabapentin, or Neurontin, is a GABA analog that's used as an anticonvulsant as well as an analgesic compound. But the analgesic dose is only one-third to one-tenth the anticonvulsant dose, so it may not cause as many side effects when it's used for its analgesic activity. It's used for analgesia in both dogs and cats, and it's especially useful in combination with NSAIDs, that is over-the-counter analgesics, or opiates, narcotic analgesics, because they tend to potentiate each other's effects. It's an analog of GABA. Gabapentin increases the concentration of GABA by modulating the enzymes involved in its synthesis. So it's not uh, influencing the channels or receptors and so forth as much as other anticonvulsants do. Gabapentin is absorbed poorly. Uh, gabapentin in a car bill is another derivative that is increased, that has increased oral of bioavailability over the gabapentin. It's excreted by the kidney, so don't use it in animals with kidney damage. Adverse effects include the usual sedation and ataxia. So avoid rapid withdrawal because of enhanced seizure sensitivity. It's teratogenic, so don't use it in pregnant animals. And some liquid forms contain xylitol, a sweetener that's toxic to dogs. So it should be compounded specifically for canine use. The last analgesic anticonvulsant is pregabalin, or Lyrica. It's used in dogs and cats for both epilepsy, for example, when refractory to phenobarbital, and for neuropathic pain. It binds calcium channels to decrease calcium influx. By doing this, it decreases the release of glutamate, a major excitatory neurotransmitter. The side effect is largely sedation. In summary, anticonvulsants act in many different ways. Drugs used more for analgesic than for anticonvulsant activity will be shown here in green and the others in red. Inhibitory effects produced by chloride flux through GABA receptor complexes is promoted by phenobarbital and diazepam. Chloride channels carry bromide ions that hyperpolarize neurons and sodium channels that normally carry excitatory activity are inhibited by zonisamide. Calcium channels that are important in neurotransmitter release are inhibited by pregabalin, zonisamide, and levetiracetam. Synaptic vesicles are also inhibited by binding to levetiracetam. Adenosine A1 receptors are activated activated by carbamazepine. And finally, GABA synthesis is enhanced by gabapentin. There are lots of anticonvulsants, but only a few are used widely in veterinary medicine. Because of the wide therapeutic ratio of drugs like phenobarbital, the dose can be increased as needed prior to resorting to a new drug or a new drug combination. Know what options might be available in cases that are refractory to phenobarbital. This will broaden your therapeutic options, but it's almost impossible to remember all the characteristics of the lesser used compounds. 
and the constellation of drugs available changes over time, making it difficult to keep abreast. So keep a current file of class notes, drug inserts, or reference material to review prior to prescribing less frequently used drugs. This allows you to consider all the most recent contraindications, drug interactions, and side effects as they might relate to a single patient without having to retrieve this information from your memory. Epilepsy is a long-term condition that requires very expensive drugs. So it's worth a bit of homework to derive the best drug combination for your patient.